Thanks. Um, so I, I got a lot of slides. I'm going to go quick here. Uh, and um, I really, uh, when uh, Bill McElhaney asked me to talk about this, there's maybe a couple of points I want to get into and, and really a little bit about the history of network arches. That's what the first part will be. And then North Haven uh, will be towards the end. So I'll just flow right into it. Um, I'm really going to uh, represent both uh, how network arches developed and a little bit uh, our take on network arches. And then I'm going to take you on kind of a wild tour of maybe a half dozen bridges and and uh, I think you'll get the idea. So we're up at about uh, a dozen projects and maybe 25 spans. There's three or four of these under construction or under design uh, right now as we speak, North Haven being one of them. Um, also, we're seeing use of network arches for vehicular bridges, obviously. And because I'm here at Textile, I'm going to focus more on vehicular bridges and pedestrian bridges. But we're doing railroad bridges right now with this technology. And so we're seeing just wide adoption of this technology everywhere, really. So it began, and this is a, an interesting moment, it began with this, this little Norwegian guy. By the way, I can't believe, David, that they named a bridge after an engineer. I want to, that's a first. I got to write that down. But, um, yeah, exactly. But so, the, so this little Norwegian guy um, did his PhD thesis on network arches, on these arches with cables that cross. And then his mom, and I'm not making this up, he's, he and I became close friends. He's taught a couple of my classes. And he said, this is exactly what happened. His mom knew the Secretary of Transportation for Norway and said, hey, my son just spent four years studying this. You got to give him a project or two. And so this this Ballsted Strauman bridge was his first project of using this technology. Um, at the same time in Germany, Leonhard, so Leonhard and Andra developed also a, uh, a network arch just so totally independently developed a network arch for a combined highway rail bridge. And I'll get into why that's a good idea in a second. But um, I'd say Pear's philosophy on all of this was slenderness. He felt like once you crossed cables, you could get a very slender arch, or almost ridiculously slender arch, and he was using just pre-stressed concrete decks. So no girders, no nothing, just a pre-stressed concrete deck. That was the idea for these two bridges he did. And then after he did them, he went back to being a university professor and never did anything. With, with bridge engineering again, up until the point that he retired, and that's how I got to know him, is he started going on these world tours talking about network arches. And so this is just some excerpts from a lecture he gave to my class. And it just highlights a couple things that are remarkable about these systems and why he was so focused on slenderness and not to get too into this. And I don't know if the laser pointer works, but um, these are influence lines. If I can move, the influence line side of things, a network arch, same bridge, same span line, same everything. With an arch with vertical angles. And so it's, it's true of the arch with bending moments. It's true of the of the deck bending moments. So it's really so what happens with network arches is you get this circumstance where all the bending moments go away. And when you take the bending moments away, you can get slenderness. That was at least the idea. And he came up with some some uh, some logic to how you handle uh, network cables and think about them. None of this is, I think, very important. Um, but but he, he had a bunch of PhD students who continued to do work in this space. And, you know, one of the things you worry about with a very slender arch is buckling, right? So he, he went through this, this analytics of what is the stiffness of the arch and its propensity to buckle? And what happens with network arches is the cables, you can get lesser and lesser and lesser and shallower depth arches and still not buckle. So it doesn't, it's not a linear buckling thing at all. It's because the the uh, the, the network arch and the cables really act. I, I like to think of it as spokes on a wheel for the same reason that spokes on a wheel. And if we, uh, those of you who ride out there, and this is for Mr. McElhaney, the more crosses you have on the spoked wheel, the stronger it is for very similar reasons. But to, to appreciate, so so Pear was doing this work in the uh, in the 1950s, so all without a computer or with, with lots of hand calculations. And so this is the nastiest thing that he had to do. So the problem with network arches is the compression cables want to relax under load. So if you have very little dead load, 
she used very slender stuff and very significant live loads. So think railroad bridges, the cables that are in want to be in compression. If you're thinking about this as a trust, want to relax. So he went through and calculated which cables would relax in which order. So this is all piecewise static nonlinear non analysis done by hand. <laughs> yeah, and so you get the idea. There's a lot of work to do this, and then what you know, taking just one point and calculating what the displacement or the maximum stress was was you know months and months of work in the in the 1950s. So he definitely deserved a PhD thesis. Um, for me, and, and, and this is the weird part of the story, is I had one of those Leonhard Andre experiences that I had no idea of the work that he was doing. And we came, we came up with this idea of network arch for a project in West Virginia called the Blenner Hassett Island Bridge. And um, we had completely different perspectives. And I want to come back to why that matters. But more or less, I want to leave you the idea that a network arch is only a truss with pre-stressed and for that reason, replaceable diagonals. There's nothing, it's a lattice truss, yeah? And so for me, the idea of, of covered bridges, so we have a lot of covered bridges where I grew up and covered bridges are usually in terrible shape. Half the diagonals are rotted, but they stay up. They just have a lot of, of, of uh, internal redundancy. And it's really that redundancy piece that got us interested. So this Blenner Hassett Island Bridge we started, so David mentioned there was the moratorium in 1978. Well, this was trying to end the moratorium for a tide arch. So this was the first major tide arch that federal highways allowed after that time. And part of what our logic was is we used stitching. So you heard from, from Todd that, uh, this morning about stitched connections and how they work for redundancy and, and, and the work that Jason's done at, at, and, and Rob Connor at Purdue. We used that technique before it was permitted and it was still outlawed until Rob Connors, I mean, not considered a strategy, but we had the idea, we wanted to be able to lose not just a flange plate, but also a web plate in a tide arch and have the arch still support live load. Yeah, so that was the impulse. And in order to do that, you have to, you have to shed moment as much as possible. And so we were looking at cable arrangements and we came up with this idea of cable of cross cables really getting rid of the moments. And so I'll just walk through what the, so this is arch, arches don't like asymmetric load. So this is five eighths of the main span loaded with live load. And this is the difference, everything the same, same arch rib, same tie girder, same, same cable cross sectional area. And you get, as soon as you cross the cables, you get 10 times less deflection. Yeah, an order of magnitude less deflection. Similarly with moments, this is moment diagrams and in, in extreme moment conditions. And as soon as you cross the cables, they've reduced by a factor of 10. Yeah, and so this gave us the ability, and again, we weren't focused on the arch rib so much. We were focused on the tiger. Once we did that, we had no problem meeting the redundancy criteria with the tiger or even with lost plates. So the other piece of this, so here you get the ideas. We were looking at tie girder safety. That was the whole impulse for cross cables in the beginning. The next piece in all of this is we had we had quite, uh, this was an, an eight, almost a 900 foot span. So almost twice the bridge David was talking about with only a seven foot arch rib and about a five foot deep, I should say five foot deep arch rib and, a, and, a, and about a seven foot deep tie girder. So already much more slender than a true arch. But we also wanted to use stay cables. And these were, we, we had uh, floor beams and stay cables. And the cables were, these would be, bit, would have been very big for, for, uh, for wire rope or structural strand. And so once we got to stay cables, stay cables, if you design a cable stay bridge, you design for cable loss. And so we got into this, well, how do these structures behave under cable loss? And that's where the magic happens once again. Under a lost cable, you get almost no uh, moments. Yeah, so your ability to tolerate a lost cable is significantly better and no impact on arch stability. So this is a little video if I get this to play. Be shocked. I don't know. Maybe I'll stick. I don't really. Huck. Yeah. Help me out. I gotta I gotta advance the slides so that oh I know bigger distance going on. Yeah. yeah, that's a try. Just just shows the dynamic effects of the I don't know if you're seeing it, doesn't matter. Okay, so, uh, oh, now it's, now it's not advancing. That's the two screen size.
that, yeah, that's a different. I mean, my two favorite people too. Yeah, don't worry about the video. Just if we can get back to that screen. Get two screens right, but the stuff we're trying to show is on the screen that's not showing that. There's the video. Yes, yeah, see if I can advance that now. Yeah, okay. there we go. Yeah, all right. Somehow fixed. Um, so the other the other thing with the system is we had we decided here floor beams and a floating deck, and so the stringers. So a, a pretty similar system, but we wanted the deck not to get integrated with the structural uh, with the tie girders and the tight arch. And that's both an interesting idea, but it has some challenges. So the the the, the cables are spaced at about uh, or the arch the panel points are about uh, 67 feet, and so we needed stringers to span between floor beams. You really got to watch. The problem they had with tight arches is floor beam lateral bending and some fractures around the floor beam connections. So we were pretty careful about that, and that's one of the reasons we wanted the deck to float. Um, I wouldn't do this again, so I would say even for a bridge this size, I think we, we've gone away from this, but uh, uh, just as a, this was the beginning, so this on the on the history side. The other thing is, is that we used with stay cables, we had a, a, a box arch and a box tie and all the cable connections were made inside of the box. Um, this is a, a layout we did for the box, for the lower cable connection and you get the idea. Floor beam comes in, cables come out, pick up the floor beam. I wouldn't do that again either. It's just in the land of it was it was an interesting idea, but I don't think it stood the test of time. And, and I'll talk a little bit about where why we went to other places. We also even the cable connection because you're putting putting a big hole in your tension tie member. Even the uh, the bolted connections around the cable perforating the the top cord. We uh, we made sure that we replaced the cross sectional area, and that those are all tension bolts for obvious reasons. The state cable system, um, these were these cables, and we had to come up with some some details about the cables rubbing at each other, but all that worked out well. And, and here I want to highlight every time we do an arch, you got to figure out the construction, the construction. And, and David said it, it's super complicated in these circumstances. Jay Rollins, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember Jay Rollins, who's since passed. Um, he showed us how to erect this bridge and without him, I mean, he knew more about this than then uh, he forgot more about this than we knew. So, so I learned a lot from him about arch erection and it made me think a lot about how to do arches in the future and you'll see that in a second. Um, getting the, uh, getting the, the, uh, the crown section of the arch is always an adventure. Here we did lateral bracing as we went. You gotta force the arch open. We installed the cables afterwards. All of those struts were jackable and removable. This is just getting ready to pour. This was a cast in place deck. We don't do cast in place deck so much anymore um, for some reasons that I'll explain in a second. And so that was that was uh, Leonard Hassett. And then so about five years later, I got involved in an emergency project uh, where I grew up in the Adirondacks. And this bridge up at the top um, had severe, um, it had a lot of corrosion damage to the truss itself. But the piers, which were unreinforced, had so much damage at the water line that the expansion pier was moving back under thermal cycles two inches. Yeah, and so we couldn't, we, we actually, uh, it was another consultant doing the ratings and we said, well, just take into account thermal effects and see how the bridge rates and it rated zero. So the bridge got, the bridge got closed. Um, that was, so this is a bridge. So it, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. This bridge serves it. The, the daily traffic is 3,500 people. There's nobody there, literally. But the problem is, is in the winter time, it's a hundred mile detour. So everybody lost their mind uh, because you know they were sharing hospitals, fire departments. It was just a, a mess. So both states declared states of emergency, and this turned in, into one of those projects where it was really a rush. Um, and we got into a little bit more on 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 cable. Um, cable loss and redundancy, and this is a little video that it'll play, but it's not important. We were able to show that not only could you lose one cable, you could lose the next adjacent cable and the next adjacent cable and still have enough capacity to operate under live load. Bananas, right? So this idea that you can lose a diagonal, but you can lose multiple diagonals next to each other. That's what's uh, remarkable about network arches. 
So I want to get across, if nothing else today, that these are the safest structures I know. Now I'm little, and so I like little tiger. It was a pretty little bridge, so that's a little tie girder. That's a, that tie girder is uh, the, the total height of the tie girder is about four foot six. Not very comfortable to be inside. And as you can see, um, those are seven strand uh, stay cables. This was all done. This bridge was designed and built in in uh, in less than two years. Yeah, and e even through the environmental process, and we had to demo the old bridge and build on the same alignment. So it was a super fast track project. DSI, this was the first time they used their stay cable and these fork sockets. Everything, you know, just the, the the way everybody worked together was remarkable. But the story here is about erection, and I don't know if I can get this video to play. Um, it'll be clear in a second. It doesn't much matter. Um, but the idea here is this is a, over landlocked lake. There's no monster cranes you're going to bring and set up, and that would have delayed the project. So here, the approaches are designed to pick the bridge up. So this is all strand jacks on the end of the approaches, and the amount the approaches project out to grab the arch is the width of the barge. How do we know what the width of the barge is? That's the size of the lock. Yeah, so we knew all of this stuff coming in, and so all of that was, and now you could say this, this bridge was designed in 10 weeks. You'd say you don't take into account that kind of constructability in 10 weeks. I'd argue the other way around. You got to get the construction right. So, so this, the bridge was built about a mile away. You can see it was built on land, but it had little fingers where you could drive the barge in and pick it up. You know, once the arch is picked up, you float it out. This is the strand jack system ready to go. Big E's actually an outfit on the West Coast. I don't know why. Flatiron was a contractor. I don't know why they ended up with Big E strand jacks, but um, there the, the bridge is, uh, the arch is getting floated in. And this is what saved us time, right? Because you can build the approaches and you can build the arch separately. And, and Ronnie, um, Ronnie did both, so so High Steel did both, and he he, wor he worked out of two shops. So he was doing the arch in one shop, and he was doing the approaches in the other shop. And and that, you know, in my view, really saved a tremendous amount of time. We would not have been able to build this bridge this fast without because we had a not, not only because we're building on alignment, we had to demo, we had to, <laughs> we had to demo existing foundations and build on and build new foundations on the same alignment. So that's the float in operation. That's just. Um, that's the day before Hurricane Irene, so no pressure. So that the, this this hurricane devastated Vermont and upstate New York. So so we were, even though it looks like a beautiful day, it was not a beautiful day the next day. So the contractor did a great job getting this thing up and buttoned up, and we had no damage after the after the hurricane, thankfully. This is where we went to precast uh, post tension decks. It's it's actually a, quite a bit safer to use precast, and in, in the the erection stresses with pouring the deck can be pretty tricky. Here's what the bridge looks like at the end, and and that idea of getting the reflection off the lake was the, that's the thing with lakes is you get that reflection that you don't get in rivers. So that was some of that was intentional. It came out a lot better than I thought it would have. So another one, and you know, so these are all actually these bridge replacements, and I'll go through this quick. This is another one, and. I-95, the big north-south uh, corridor, and this is north of Boston. And this bridge is, I would say, pretty plain Jane, but it picked up on what we did with Champlain. Champlain, because we figured we didn't need, we used that different cable system, that means we didn't need a box skirt or arch. Once you're in a I-section arch, and Ronnie can attest to this, is it's just much easier to fabricate, much simpler. And so, so uh, this is probably the longest, flattest span I would do. It's about 500 feet is where the arch can be an I section, and uh, this had a a, a, a box uh, a box tie. And we've done them both ways too. I'll show you some examples of non-box ties. But typical box ties are the, are the strategy. This is a, quite a wide bridge, so that there was two bridges, northbound and southbound. Northbound was about 90 95 feet. Here, probably the most interesting thing about this was the erection strategy. So this was design build, same deal. We had to figure out the erection strategy and this we were working with Genesis structures and this is just some of the cable connections and details, pretty similar. The knuckle, you gotta be able to make the knuckle small enough that it's over the road transportable. But really here, the erection equipment was clever. So we use these MyJacks overhead gantries and we built all the deck. The deck had only two false work supports, so we could run the gantries out to build the deck. On so they had launching, they had launching beams. A little hard to see, but there's a launching beam. See that launching beam? So the gantries run along the launching beam, set all the superstructure. And then the clever thing is, is that 
after the superstructure is set, you build the arch, you put a crane on the deck and the floor beams and the temporary supports were designed for the crane on the deck to build the, yeah, see, I'm doing it just like David. Um, you, so you're using that to build the arch and to set all the precast panels. And so the funny thing, the MyJacks were designed to pick up the crane to deliver the crane to the deck. That was the governing load on the MyJacks was the crane body. And so this is just finished product. So project. So that there's one side and then we, we actually use the same gantry to take down the other bridge and build the other one side by side. So a little bit about railroad bridges and probably textile is not so interested in railroad bridges, but this really speaks to how flexible these systems are. And so we're typically designing these for very heavy loads. So this is the busiest rail corridor in the country, about 450 trains a day. Uh, and this, um, we're replacing an existing swing bridge that is really tired and ready for replacement. In this case, we used, we're using three, and this is all under construction right now. We're using three. I think, Ronnie, you're fabricating the, some of the approaches on this, right? So there's, uh, there's three network arches, and I think they're actually being fabricated by different, at different shops, interestingly. I think one's even being done by Vigor out in the West Coast. But the idea here and, and getting both Amtrak and New Jersey Transit to think about this system because they're used to trusses, right? It's really to me that these are trusses. I like to think about these behave like trusses, act like trusses. They're trusses with replaceable diagonals. Now the diagonals have to be pre-stressed too. But if you look at that and you say that top core, that, uh, that arch rib is the top cord of a truss and the tie girder is the bottom cord of a truss, doesn't look out of proportion at all, does it? In fact, I would argue we should probably be making truss cords a little beefier than what we are now just for this reason because you get a lot of additional safety with some and I, i'm also partial to the lattice trusses too i think there's some advantages so this is pretty garden variety we use day cables here typical cable angles this was designed for cooper e80 for strength and e60 for fatigue and this is ballasted deck so the deck's relatively heavy but the trains are super heavy and so getting fatigue to work on the state cables is the tricky part. So the state cables are significantly oversized here. So they're probably twice the cross-sectional area they would need to be if it wasn't for fatigue. So fatigue governs all of this. And we're right now doing another project. So that's under construction. It's a one and a half billion dollar project. We're right now doing another project in, uh, in Maryland. Now this is just for Amtrak. This one is an interesting project because it's replacing a similar old tire bridge, but this one has heavy freight on it. And, uh, and the problem with heavy freight is the fatigue loads get very significant. So designing for Cooper 80 really pushed us to a somewhat different cable arrangement. Instead of using stay cables, we're using a lock coil and, and doubling up. So part of this is just showing you the adjustability and the capability. These are all two track structures, by the way, when we first did, when we, our first version of portal was a three track structure. So I don't see any reason we can't do three track st structures with this, even though they're unusual systems. But now, now a little bit about pedestrian bridges. So you've got, you know, you got heavy freight rail, and now I want to go to the to a much lighter system. So this was a replacement of a bridge of a project that was over budget that was supposed to be a cable stayed bridge, and they had about a four million dollar budget, and the bids came in at at eight million dollars. And I had just done a similar sort of rescue project for the adjacent, this was actually for um, city of San Jose, but for the adjacent, for Cupertino, I'd, I'd done a similar kind of rescue project for an over budget thing. And and it, that was a cable state. And they said, well, what would you do here? And I said, you know, this is one where I think a network arch would be a, a great solution. And so the trick here, and this is going to sound crazy, but the trick here is it's it's a great place for weathering steel. So it's, it's San Jose area. So Southern California, or maybe um, middle California. Um, the problem with rolled sections, I wanted to use all rolled sections. The problem with rolled sections and weathering steels, you need a 20 ton minimum order, right? So the logic for me was, okay, let's do this out of one. Let's do the arch rib. So there's two of these bridges. Let's do the arch ribs out of one rolled section and let's do the tie girder and the lateral bracing out of another rolled section cut in half. So the tie girder is a, a, you know, it's, not making this up. The tie girders a WT nine by thirty eight. You know all this, and and the arch ribs of fourteen one hundred nine. And Stinger fabricated this, so this is a, a fabricator that 
that does a lot of buildings and then is very familiar with the bending process. But you, it's a little weird to think that the tie girder and the lateral bracing is the same cross section. But here, that's what it was. And so the other thing is, is I'm interested in the logistics piece. So these all ship, so Stingers in Arizona, these guys all ship on, on trucks, trucks nicely, right? So, so all of these, you know, and for us, we really like to figure that out. Where are the splices? Everything's got to be over the road shippable, nothing more than 65 feet. And then you assemble it in the, at the site and then just pick the pieces up. So um, the other, the usual logic I you do is organized cables at the deck and spray the cables because the cable angles turn out to be important. Spray the cables on the arch. This was the opposite of that because we had sort of a continuous deck. And that, it's, it's going to seem a little weird, but that, that's a WT section. That's that same WT that we're using for the lateral bracing. We're just connecting the cables to a WT, the, to, the, to the web of a WT, and that's all what this is. And even, even the cable cables are at slight angles. So that's a little bit more on the top connection. So that's just a W14 with a, with a, with a plate welded in, and, and then these are, these are, it's a pedestrian bridge, so the cables are much smaller. And this is a little bit about the the uh, the knuckles always a challenge with these projects. Erection here on the the one bridge was dead easy because you could get cranes in there. The, the other the other span had to be built over, and I can tell you there's not much nature left in this part of San Jose. But this little piece was going from a parking lot to a to a children's uh, park. I mean, you, they had some endangered species, so we couldn't be in the in the uh, in the riparian zone. So this all had to be built in a pretty complicated way. And the contractor's engineer, you know, these are little projects, right? So the contractor's engineer got a little lost. So the contractor, and this wouldn't happen with the DOT, but the contractor asked us if we would take over the erection engineering. And so we did. So we did all of the erection engineering and the erection engineering for a bridge like this is very complicated, especially the more number of stays the more number of cross cables, the diff, the more difficulty tuning. So these are really tuning exercises. And uh, I wanted to start this, and I, I forgot, I shouldn't have. I wanted to start by saying, I'm so pleased to be here because you guys, <clears throat> you guys um, have provided the industry with more knowledge than you can know. So I've used so much of TxDOT's research for the work that I do. And uh, the, the guy who's behind all of this work is and, and my partner, and we were working for different companies at Blenner Asset. He's a he's a UT product. So so uh, I'm happy to be here because I can tell you <clears throat> the practice owes you a great debt. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why I'm emotional about that. Um, so so um, this all of this is is uh, but that's really it's really heartfelt. The uh, the other piece of this was. Pedestrian bridges, the railing is freaking expensive. So part of the logic here, because this project was so over budget, was could we get rid of the railing? So this is a bridge with no railing because all we did was stretch a mesh and attach it to the cables. So one of the reasons we had so many cables, which pissed Gregor off because he had so much, there was so much complication to tuning the cables, was to avoid the was to avoid the railings. And I would do that again. It's complicated, but I would do that again. And so there's the two bridges. And so these were done um, for, for less than $4 million. So for two, um, 275 foot arch bridges. And so now I come to North Haven. So I'm getting to the end here. So North Haven is really the continuation, continuation of a trail system. And the problem is crossing I-75. And, and some of this, um, the, the real alignment of the bridge for reasons that are complicated, but had to do with just land rights, was the bridge had to be at a pretty significant skew. And so the thing, if you think about this as a truss, you wouldn't skew an arch, right? But when you think about it as a truss, you're like, we skew trusses all the time. So I've always wanted, in the back of my mind, to do a skewed, tru a skewed network arch with the same logic, right? So these are just a couple of images of it. This bridge is under construction right now, but it looks weird, right? It just looks weird. And, you know, I'm thinking it's, it's maybe more of an Austin, right? An Austin weird. But to, to, to me, part of it was to, to try to see how flexible this form is and how adaptable it is. Now, there was also an interest about an S-curved, you know, and it reduces the skew just a little bit, but an S-curved plan view. And so you get the idea. Skewed arch, that's kind of an S-curve and plan. 
And so it's a pretty complicated bit of fabrication. But in terms of the structural system, you know, you get the idea. It's truss everywhere. I mean, it really is. You get truss lateral bracing, you get truss diagonals, I mean, the truss cables. It's a truss box. And so, you know, these are just, this is the, the design drawings. Here's the other beauty is with skewed arches, the arches are identical with each other. They're just shifted, right? So the only thing that you have to make up is the difference in the lateral bracing, which is complicated, and the, de and the deck system, you know, that's right in the way. The deck system, um, the deck system is a little complicated as well. I, I'd have to say that just because of the S curvature. And I, I wasn't sure that the S curve was going to survive, but I think it makes it more interesting. So this is current shots from construction. There's the arches, or they got to pour the deck first. This is all built on false work. And then this one, in terms of getting the erection right, so this was all designed to be SPMT'd into, you know, physically picked up and moved into the site. And so you got to remove a barrier uh, on I-75 to pull that off. But that's that's the logic, right? So we're just working through the SPMT moves, and there needs to be some lateral bracing. That's that's there's some erection submittals. And the one thing I would say about bridges at this scale is they're very challenging for, uh, you know, it's a lot of complexity for small for small dollars. And so that's the one thing I would say about uh, arches, especially network arches at the pedestrian scale, just making sure you get good erection engineering and the tuning is really tricky. I would say that's the one thing that we haven't gotten the industry to be as far along as maybe we would like. So I think in the future, more work about how to tune uh, uh, network arches will make them, uh, I think, much more available as a structural system. But what, what I really want to end with, and and um, and I really feel strongly about this, is that these structural systems are so much safer, and I mean that safer than arches with vertical hangers. And so I think we really have to look at whether vertical hanger arches are safe enough in some circumstances, especially when you think about the ability to uh, tolerate cable loss. And a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, we, we went through a whole period and the problem with the 1978 with that, with that whole um, land of tight arches was in those days, you use very deep ties and very slender arches. And so the, the problems we have out there are the tie girders are, have, cracks, right, that we're worried about. But for me, it's also that the arch ribs themselves don't have a lot of intrinsic stability because of the vertical hangers. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm very much, a, 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 let's say, a huge advocate to network arches. And, um, and I also, I, I feel like these are safer, quite a bit safer than trusses because of the replaceability of the stays themselves. So that's it. Okay, so got uh, a little bit of time for questions, I guess, for either, and then we'll we'll take a break once once we have a an opportunity for that. Yes, Ted. Uh, Ted, so you and Gregory and your team, yeah. probably are the most. I would say maybe one of the most experienced design teams. In the country with kind of like what our set for say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think we've done maybe 75 or 80 or something. Yeah. And can you talk then? Is there a case to be made where right out of the gate, network tight arch bridge does not need to be considered fracture critical in any way, shape, or form? But that additional analysis that now is required for SRM or IRM does not be required for this. It's almost the equivalent of building. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would I would say that with an with an internally redundant tie, there's there's nothing that's fractured. In fact, what we've been careful about, even with the floor system, so we use tight floor beam spacings. Maybe I should have mentioned that. Part of my logic is um, after Bonner Hassett, where we had pass in place deck on stringers, we went to very short floor beam spacing. And the idea there is, is that the deck can span even if we lose a floor beam, so that the floor beam is no longer fracture critical. So the idea is there's nothing fracture critical in the system, but you're using internal redundancy. And at the time when we were doing these projects, by the way, 
Rob Connor's, Connor's work wasn't done. So we, we did have those battles with federal highways, but federal highways to their credit said, you know what, this is a good strategy. We don't know if it's meets all the good East housekeeping seal of approval, but, but we think this is a good strategy. And so that's why they permitted us to do it. Um, I would tell you right now, I feel like there's a real case to be made that network tied arches are, and maybe we need to promote some of this, but network tied arches are as robust a structural system as we have. I mean, they're, I would say they're really an order of magnitude safer than trusses. And then the components are replaceable and you can tolerate lots of damage and they just don't make better st structural systems that I can think of. We have a question from the chat. Yeah, sure. What kind of practical span lengths can we get out of these arches? So the Winter Hassett was 900 feet. Um, I think my my sense is at about 600 feet, you need a box arch, and and you know the tie curter depth and and archer depth are not very sensitive to span lengths. So you're just you're just you just need cross sectional area. But I would say practical limits of 11 or 1200 feet, but and I was looking, we really need a span. This is one of the things we were talking about last night. We really need a span optimization chart. Like I would say at 11 or 1200 feet, it should be a cable state bridge. I think from 400 feet or 450 feet to 900 feet, it should be a, a, a network arch. And that's maybe something else I should say. I don't know if this is helpful, but when I started my career, all I did was cable state bridges. First 10, 15 years of my career, Every project I did was a cable state bridge. Right now I do more arches than more network arches than I do cable state bridges. And I just think that that's, and that's all happened in, well, it was 2005 or so. I mean, that all happened in the last 15 years. So the first 15 years of my career, cable state bridges only. The next, the next 15, I'd say two thirds of the projects are network arches, but it's in that smaller span range. I think the longest line that's right. Yeah. And, you know, even some of the very long ones, um, they don't have, uh, they don't have network cables too. And so that to me is, that starts to me to be edgy. Like the, 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 the value of crossing the cables is so compelling when you look at the numbers. I have students do this. They don't believe it. No. How can you get a 10 times reduction in deflection? All I did is check the cables and do this. Just crazy. It's, it doesn't make intuitive sense. And we we had to do it like over and over again to prove to owners that here's how much the deflections. Railroad bridges, right? Long span railroad bridges are very deflect deflection sensitive. I don't think you can get there without a network uh, tie, a network uh, or a cable arrangement. Yeah. I want to steal all the questions. I um, what, what's the what's the Oh, you, you asked that, that was a question I love to be asked. Um, I don't know if I can, if I just, one image I think on just elevation would be good to just describe it. So the problem with the compression cables, yeah, this is good. The problem with the compression cables, if you think about it, so the compression cables under, the load's always vertical, the compression cables want to relax. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so the right the cable that wants to be in compression wants to relax when you, even when you put load next to it and the tension cable wants to pick up more load. So the problem is is the tension cable is always getting getting more tension and the cable that wants to be in compression is always unloading. Right, so that's not ideal and we don't want cable. You know, so the parrot's bite's concern about the compression cables relaxing and it's. It's these cables we really got to worry about. In my view, if, as long as I'm using post tensioning, like a state cable system, I put whatever course I want in them. So my logic is you take the tension cable and you unload it, and you take the compression cable and you add a load to it. That's why I do pre stress. And the reason I call these pre stress diagonals is I'm just taking the compression cable. What would be a compression member in a typical truss? I'm saying I'm just going to pre stress both of them. So in my view, ideal would be the compression cable has more load in it than the tension cable. And when the tension cable loads and it unloads the compression cable, that would be the system. Does that make sense? So a lot of this is, is contingent upon you, I mean, three or four things, but it's contingent upon you being able to jack. 
That's the other interesting. You need adjustable cables. This is not a problem where you have cables that are difficult to adjust. That's not a good idea. You will be tuning these cables. Yeah. This is probably a dumb spot, but is there any way to incorporate like a spring or something into it? Where so so we, we looked at that, that. And, and it's funny. So part of what we do, it's, a, it's actually a great question. Part of what we do, if you change the angle of the cable, you change its stiffness, its vertical stiffness. So that's a little bit, if I go to the, figure out which tool we use here. If I go to the reason you can see how these, how these tension cables are flatter and the compression cables are, are steeper. So the idea here is I'm trying to unload, right? I'm trying to carry more load with the compression cables and less load with the tension cables, which is doing just like what you said. And we have looked and I've done it, that I've played around with this idea that we, we should perhaps be putting um, springs like, like you're familiar with disc bearings, like putting so we need something that takes a lot of uh, compress, compressive stress, but putting disc bearing type elements under under hangers. And I'm not quite there yet, but it's, it's not a bad idea for exactly these reasons, right? But then you can so stiff. Yeah. Because the unloading one doesn't take much force to slack or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but it's 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 a it's a good idea, right? It's just you're you're just trying to proportion what unloads and what loads, right? And if you can change the stiffness, that would be good. It's another way of skidding the cat, so it's not at all. Yeah. All right, thank you.